I had the pleasure this morning of attending a press conference at the Arizona Museum of Natural History in downtown Mesa, where I volunteer, where they named a brand new dinosaur this morning, Suskytyrannus hazelay, which is named after Hazel Wolf. Um, it, the name means Hazel's Coyote Tyrant. It was formerly nicknamed Little Tooth around the museum before this announcement. Here's part of the press conference, starting with museum director Tom Wilson. This story's been a long time coming, about 92 million years long. It has been long in another way, too. Associates, volunteers, and students of the Arizona Museum of Natural History found and collected two little tyrannosaurs of the same species between 1996 and 1998. They were found about 50 meters from one another, which makes me, anyway, wonder whether they were siblings who died as juveniles in the same event. Subsequently, a team of scientists studied the remains of the two tyrannosaurs, and today we celebrate the publication of the results in the journal Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. I am flanked by two elements of our celebration. Here is the mounted skeleton of the animal, the little gray one. And here is the lifetime life-size model of the creature. This is an early tyrannosaur from the Middle Cretaceous deposits from the Zuni Basin in New Mexico. For various reasons, Middle Cretaceous deposits about 92 million years ago are quite rare, so fossils from such deposits are also quite scarce. This animal is an intermediate form between the very early theropod dinosaurs, those the carnivores, uh, of the earlier Cretaceous and the bone-crunching giants roaming the landscape just before their extinction 27 mil million years later, such as the T. Batar over there, which is an Asian tyrannosaur and also a juvenile. So that is not a full-grown uh, T-Rex either. I'm going to call upon Hazel Wolf, one of the principals of the Zuni Basin Project, to unveil the name of, and explain the name of the dinosaur. The name is Suski Tyrannus Hazelay, and this is Hazel's Coyote Tyrant. And I'm very honored to have our students and colleagues choose me to be the namesake for this dinosaur. This culminates uh, 25 years worth of work that we've been doing with students around the world and researchers, and uh, it's a great moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. It's truly an honor to be here and also to see so many great friends. And as Dr. Wilson uh, alluded to, we couldn't possibly enumerate them all at this point in time. But I do want to thank Benji for the outstanding reconstruction, uh, Sherman and the SPS at large for all of the support they've given us over uh, 20, 30 years now. Um, 300 million years ago, um, or I should say over the last 300 million years, the Earth has undergone very many climatic revolutions. We've had ice house Earths, greenhouse Earths, but in that 300 million year period, none of them matches the greenhouse Earth of the Middle Cretaceous about 90 to 92 million years ago. Sea level at that point in time, as we worry about today, was greatly higher than it is now. Carbon dioxide levels may have been five, six, seven thousand parts per million at the time. So we truly worried what uh, the geochemists have called a hothouse earth. Not a greenhouse earth, but something that was very extreme. Because of that, oceans rose greatly over the land, dividing North America in two completely, from Alaska, uh, Canada, all the way down to Mexico. So a Suski Tyrannus, living along the Arizona and Mexico border, could have actually walked to Mongolia at that time, but would have had to swim to Canada. And because of that, this area, what we call the Mogollon Highlands, the Mogollon Rim, turns out to have been a fairly substantial mountain range at that point in time. And although sea level rose greatly, the Mogollon Highlands were rising as well, preserving a small basin we call the Zuni Basin, which contains some of the very rare Middle Cretaceous terrestrial deposits. And by that I mean we have fossil trees, we have coal swamps, we have crocodiles, and of course we have dinosaurs. Now, it was my graduate work to try and understand this terrestrial strata. I worked on the marine fossils, and the marine fossils showed us that we had this unique package of sediments up near Zuni Plateau 
People know Zuni Pueblo, it's a beautiful place, beautiful area, a good place to go visit. And so we started uh, with the help of Bob Denton and Hazel and Jim Kirkland, looking in some places that apparently nobody had looked before. Thank you. The discovery and collection of Suski Tyrannus by Doug and Sterling about over 20 years ago, and this a publication and announcement today, neatly bookend 20 years of research and the building of a significant research collection at the Arizona Museum of Natural History. Between those bookends, besides the significant Zuni Basin finds, a considerable body of field research has occurred. A few that come to mind are the Gilbert Mammoth, dozens of giant armadillo-like lipotherium, the first ankylosaur and the first dinosaur eggs from Arizona, and very recently, the first fossils ever found in the vicinity of Ajo, Arizona. Our collection has increased in size and importance as well. I still meet people who think that all of our fossils are on display in the museum, but nothing could be further from the, of the case. Uh, as a state and federal repository for fossils, most of our collection is not on display, but is available to scientists researchers. The Zuni Basin fossils have been studied by scientists across the nation. German paleontologists have come here to study Arizona Saurus, another Sterling Nesbitt. Uh, and South and Central American paleontologists have journeyed to base it to study our theories. Congratulations to Doug, Sterling, and the other authors on this publication, and I uh, expect more exciting finds from the Arizona Museum of Natural History. Thank you. You made that way. <laughs> I apologize about the back. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Benjamin Paisno. I'm the paleo artist who's been working with the Arizona Museum of Natural History for about the past three years now. And I was given the honor of collaborating with both our staff as well as the team who wrote the paper to create our model of 60 tyrannos. This animal was based off of the illustrations provided for the Nature article. And in doing so, I worked closely with Dr. Nesbitt as well as Dr. McCord and some other staff to put together this model based on the specifications that they seemed most fit. Um, this animal, how we started working on it, we worked with the Southwest Paleontological Society in order to get an updated skeletal model for the animal. These updates included changing the skull, changing the forearms, as well as shortening the tail by about one to two inches based off of the new information we had for the animal. Uh, once we were done completing that, I was able to take measurements off of the fossil. So our model here is actually based off of the skeleton that we see next to us here. Um, paleo art is a very interesting thing to present in museums because what it does is it opens up the door to people to information that they may not have access to. While not everybody is able to read a scientific paper, everybody is able to look at a dinosaur. And so these provide our museum the opportunity to reach a broader audience while still providing the information that people in the paleontological field have worked so hard to bring for us. And this model was very interesting because it is a tyrannosaur, and it also was an animal that we came to the conclusion would have feathers. Um, and that led me to the interesting choice of, do I want to put individual feathers on a dinosaur one by one, or do we want to find something else? <laughs> and as you can see here, um, this is actually a faux fur that would mimic the more proto-feather-like structure that we could assume for some dinosaurs. While some animals would have exhibited those feathers, akin to a monarch bird, a lot of the Solarosaurus, part of the Tyrannosaur family, would not have had feathers like that. And so with that, I came to the conclusion after weeks and weeks of sculpting, trying to make feathers, trying to use these faux feathers, um, that it would be easier for me in agreement with Dr. McCord that we could do it this way. And so this animal was sculpted over the course of about three weeks. We actually um, put together kind of a steel skeleton for the animal, which we built over the base with a foam, and then I sculpted over with clay, as well as sewn all the fabric on. And a lot of that feather work on there as well was done by hand as well to get that finished look. Um, it was very interesting to create a dinosaur. It's not the easiest thing to do, and it does take a lot of work. About half the time we spend making these models, we actually do spend working with people and reading papers and getting the proper scientific evidence. These, as I said before, offer our museum the chance to reach a public who may not have access or the ability to understand these papers 
yet still provide them the same opportunity that we would get from reading and understanding them. Well, it's a challenge to go after him when I'm up on, on a podium here. <laughs> He's so tall. <laughs> so I thought this was a really great opportunity um, to reflect on the importance and the influence on museums, particularly uh, because we have our, our manager of our city here. Thank you for coming, Mr. Brady. Um, so we need places like this. Budding scientists need a place to go to investigate their interests and museums, zoos, and other science institutions fulfill this role. It's been long established that career choice happens outside the classroom, and museums like ours encourage careers in STEM fields, or simply to learn more about the world around them in order to make better judgments on their lifestyle. Our museum in particular has seen many youths who started out attending camps, volunteering here, going on to become highly successful in their careers. Dr. Karen Poole was a teen volunteer and is now a professor of vertebrate pa paleontology at Stony Brook. Dr. Emily Early, who's here somewhere at the back, <laughs> um, started off here volunteering and then went on to Yale and researched Pliocene and Pleistocene vertebrates in Africa. And then she found herself coming full circle. Dr. Sterling Nesbitt, who discovered this dinosaur, was just 16 years old at the time of its discovery. He was a member of the Southwest Paleontological Society, and I can't stress enough the, how important citizen science is in making these new discoveries. If you haven't seen my video on that, please check it out. Well, if you know me, I had to get a selfie. So I'm sure you want to see more of this dinosaur. I'm going to put up some slides here next of this reconstructed skeleton, the information on display at the museum, the artist reconstruction, and an image of how it appears in Nature magazine, where I will also put a link in the video description to the article.